this is our view from up here on the horizontal stab, the uh, rooftop deck of the DC-9. Mountains all around, a little cloudy today, but that should clear up as the day goes on. Uh, the buses, yes, those will go away, but those are our temporary storage for all of our materials. Way cheaper to get those than uh, shipping containers. And they got wheels, so we can actually uh, tow them around, which is pretty handy. So any ideas you guys have of how we should actually access this thing to get up here to our little coffee table, probably two chairs, probably limit two people sounds uh, like a good liability, safe thing for me. We'll get some rails on here. But as far as how in the world to get 30 feet up here, uh, yes, we're gonna have the rock climbing holds going up the side of the tail. We've got the genie lift, but if you got any sort of more uh, user-friendly ideas, spiral staircase, whatever, leave it in the comments below. We're all ears, because I actually at this point do not have a great way to get up here for, uh, for folks. Uh, especially uh, without a genie lift or a very, very tall ladder. Um, but at the moment, until we get this a little bit more uh, braced, it's pretty sturdy, surprisingly. I think I'm gonna go ahead and get off this. It's making me a little dizzy. Uh, we had someone ask the question, when they designed this airplane originally, you know, John, that wasn't designed to be a rooftop deck. It wasn't designed to have a coffee table and chairs up there. Can it support the weight of people? And I don't know what kind of people we're talking about, the kind that go to McDonald's a lot or the people that work out. But either way, I'd say based on the sheer amount of downforce on this thing in flight um, and the fact that, yes, people do crawl all over these things to service them, I'd say it's actually pretty darn safe. If you happen to be an attorney and uh, like our videos and subscribe and give us a thumbs up, that's all great. But if you want to uh, really help us out, uh, you know, draft up a little liability form for us before we start letting our uh, students come up here and hang out up here because uh, yeah, we're probably going to need one of those. Ultimately, this whole process, two of the coolest things for me was seeing people come out of the woodwork from social media, from YouTube, and showing up here, oftentimes unannounced, with a tool belt, with tools, ready to help, and just saying, what can I do to help? I want to be a part of this project. And they work incredibly hard, put blood, sweat, and tears into it, and help us make this happen, where we don't have the funding and the resources to hire a massive construction crew and general contractors and project managers and all that stuff. So those local folks and even people from around the country that have showed up to help us make this happen, and we're always open to more help if you're interested in coming out and checking out this project, that is huge and greatly appreciated. The other thing that was really cool for me is flying around here with students and starting to hear people on the radio use this as a navigational landmark. So obviously we have Wasilla Airport, we have Big Lake Airport, we have Big Lake, we have these large landmarks that we use, Meadow Lakes area, Beaver Lake, and then hearing people call out the Flight Mike Alpha Pilot Lodge on the radio as a landmark where we have these gigantic airplanes that's easy to see from miles away. That was super cool to see all this come together. And ultimately, this is a fairly big complex with two runways, 1,200 feet and nearly 2,000 feet and three gigantic airliners. It is a really cool landmark that can be seen from miles away. And it's cool to see people really get excited about the whole process. It's exciting for me to make this happen. It's fun every day to wake up and come out here and work on the airplanes, even though I should be spending more time flight instructing and more time making videos. But it's also really cool to see the excitement in other people and ultimately the joy and entertainment that they get from this whole process. Now, overall reactions that people had to this when we first said we were doing it, most people thought we were absolutely crazy. Um, I might have had those realizations throughout the process. Uh, but overall, it's been overwhelmingly positive excitement and people really interested to see the process happen. Um, a lot of people flying low over and checking it out. Not a lot of people landing with hammers and a tool belt coming to help. Be nice if they did, but that's okay. But a lot of people excited to see the progress being made out here. We worked hard to make this happen. Is it perfect? Could it be better? Well, it certainly could be better, always. Is anybody else doing it better? Absolutely not. And I would extend the offer to anybody who wants to do this to go for it. It is incredibly difficult, expensive, and most places you simply can't do something like this. It was very special and unique that we can actually make this happen here on our property in Alaska with these rather unusual structures. 
past week we've been working pretty uh, diligently on getting the interior flooring down, the subfloor as well as our radiant heated floor, getting the windows polished up on the outside of the building and finishing these dormers on the outside of the airplane, getting all the metal on before winter sets in, trying to waterproof the wood structure underneath. So we have all metal uh, on anything that's close to the ground where there's going to be snow leaning up against it. We are going to be seeing four to six feet of snow out here very easily every year. And that is going to be piling up, especially when you have this 30 foot long roof, dumping all that snow with that standing seam roof. There's no fasteners, there's no grip, things slide down it very easily. And that was by design to be able to shed the weight off that uh, very long roof and off the airplane. Up here, we do have more T111. Uh, and that's okay because we do not have snow really resting against that part of the airplane. It's going to shed off of that wing. Uh, so we're not so worried about having the wood uh, as our final structure. Wood is much easier to work with, cut and scribe to the curve of that airplane and seal up to it than the metal siding is itself. We've got our door uh, installed now and we do have it uh, air and water sealed, which is awesome. We'll be getting a few more pieces of trim on for the rest of the day, wrapping up that floor and wrapping up polishing the windows on this side of the aircraft. We have them just about all polished up. As you can imagine on those old airliners, when you've been flying on the airlines, sometimes you sit down and you get a window seat and you're all excited, but it's all scratchy and hazy and kind of crazed. And so we actually had to go through with sandpaper. Some of it's starting as low as 80 grit, working our way up to 120, 150, 180, 220, 400, and then up to 800, 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 grit, wet sanding all that, and then going over it with a polisher several stages to bring that plexiglass back to life so that you do have exactly 78 very crystal clear windows going down your airplane house. So the plan here with our windows is to keep as many of them as possible. We had a few that were filled in with spray foam just to uh, better insulate the airplane where it was already being overlapped where the dormers were meeting the aircraft. We also have some that we spray foamed in where we are putting a shower right up against the airplane. You wouldn't see the window anyways. As far as the bedrooms go, we will have curtains because if you're here in the winter, well, it's beautiful to see the northern lights out through the window. If you're here in the summer, it's uh, beautiful to see the sun rise at 3 a.m. and the sunset at midnight. So you might want to sleep more than three hours a day. So we will have curtains that cover up those windows um, to make sure that you do get a nice room darkening effect there. As far as these lights go on the outside of the airplane, we're keeping all of these and making them functional. So we actually did run wiring before we spray foam the aircraft to actually run this two light switches in the airplane. So you can from inside your airplane. And uh, we haven't figured out exactly where we'll put those switches, if we're gonna put them in the kitchen area or living room area, or if we'll actually mount them in the cockpit and rewire all that stuff back to the cockpit. So you can sit in the cockpit, flip those overhead switches and turn on your ice inspection lights and your exterior lights to light up the rest of the airplane. We also have logo lights we installed in the tail section and uh, overhang lights as well. A lot of that will be controlled throughout the airplane with switches and then some of it's going to be controlled from the cockpit as it normally would when you were flying the airplane. Progress wise, things are going good. Sure, I could use an absolute another six months of summer to get this thing wrapped up. It would make life so much easier. But we have made good progress getting the plumbing in the ground. Septic tank is already in the ground. We have our plumbing run down. We have hot lines run on our sewer lines in case things do uh, freeze up on us. We can always plug those in and heat all of our water pipes with that hot wire. We have the foundation in the ground. Uh, we have all of the insulation in the ground that we need to frost protect the foundation. The big parts and pieces reinstalled to the airplane, the vertical stabilizer, the horizontal stabilizer, all of that. So progress wise, we're looking pretty good. There are still things that need to happen before the ground hard freezes, like driving piles down deep into the ground to support the wing tips and ultimately extend a nice big pipe for a windsock here and also driving piles on the ground to support the back end of the aircraft and the horizontal stabilizer so that you don't get that bouncy RV trailer effect when you're walking around back there. And then also uh, supporting the horizontal stabilizer so that we can turn that into a rooftop deck and a climbing wall because people, you know, rock climbing's fun. I enjoy rock climbing. I enjoy going to the rock climbing gym in Anchorage, but what would be more fun I enjoy airplanes too, so let's combine airplanes and rock climbing. And we do have some rock climbing holds to actually install to the airplane to go up the vertical stabilizer so you can access the rooftop deck up there. It's a nice little reward when you climb up the vertical stabilizer. You get to sit up there, have a beer, a cup of coffee, enjoy the sunrise, and look out at this incredible view from that uh, horizontal stab about 30 feet up in the air.
We bought this because I make bad choices. Um, I didn't really mean to buy it. It was at auction. I bid on it. By the time we got it here, we had about 18 grand into it with uh, the auction fees and the price of it. But it has proved to be an incredibly useful piece of equipment. As long as it keeps running and makes it for a year or two, I'll be thrilled. It is way safer than using the 40 foot tall ladders that were sliding around and falling off the airplane. And this thing is its pretty cool. It's going to be an amazing asset to help us build our control tower because every airport obviously needs a control tower and a windsock that is not upside down on the pole there with the flight of main name. We'll have to fix that. Um, but those poles over there, that is going to be our control tower, 60 feet up in the air. That will be uh, how we access the tail of the 727 for that rooftop deck, which is about 40 feet above ground level. And then the control tower will be 60 feet up. You'll be able to stay in there. Uh, it'll be a full uh, six walls of all glass. We'll have a bed, refrigerator, all that sort of stuff. Probably a little dry cabin set up, up in the very top there. Beautiful 360 mountain views and incredible views in the wintertime of the Northern Lights. If you're interested in being a part of this project and you want to help out on it, we're all ears. So whether it's just volunteering advice, shooting us an email, and letting us know your thoughts, leaving comments in the comments below is always helpful of different ways we could do stuff, ways to improve things, floor plan changes, mechanical changes, how to run the electric or the plumbing. We're all ears because at the end of the day, I'm not an electrician, I'm not a plumber, I'm not a carpenter, I'm none of those things, I'm a flight instructor. And we are making up a lot of this as we go and doing the best we can and learning along the way. If you're interested in coming up here and working, shoot us a resume over to CFI at flyatmikealpha.com and we'd be happy to chat with you. We will take all the help we can get to make this a reality as quickly as possible so we can get students up here training with us. We do have students on site already, but excited to have even more show up summer 2024, more guests, more flight tours, more glacier tours, more bear tours, all that stuff. Just get more stuff happening here at the Flight Mike Alpha Pilot Lodge. It's a really cool place to see it all come together and ultimately create this dream, this place of an aviation mecca here in Alaska. Now, overall goals for next week, we've got the uh, aft sauna that we've got to start working on, getting a big piece of glass on that back opening there and laying in the cedar wood for our sauna as well as our wood stove to get that thing cooking in there. We'll uh, also be getting the pilings in to replace these A-frame jacks to support the wing tips. Not that it technically needs it, but we did just bolt these wings back on and kind of made that up as far as uh, what size bolts we use. I think they were just 3 8 or half inch bolts from Ace Hardware. So we will go ahead and support those wing tips so that you can walk out there on a deck and you and me don't have to be too worried about it. And also big plans for next week, if at all possible, is moving the 727 from where it's been sitting for the last uh, six months since we moved it here onto its final foundation. Uh, the story with that has been dealing with local house movers and uh, not super impressed with them. Uh, they were saying, yeah, we can do it next week. It'll be a uh, half day or a day. We'll use your dozer, your tow bar, but we'll bring two house moving dollies and we'll charge you 7,500 bucks, you know, and, and that sounded okay. And we'll do it next week. That sounded great. And then a week went by and then it was going to be next week. But hey, you know, it's going to be like this summer we're getting 10 grand a day. So I think I'm, I need 10 grand. And okay, well, that kind of sucks. What changed? You know, nothing, but okay, well, 10 grand next week. Let's get it done. And then kind of ignoring my phone calls. And then the next week went by another week and then talked to him again and said, yeah, definitely. I can do it Monday next week. I'll be there. And you know, but I'm going to have to get 15 grand for this. I'm going to have to, you're going to have to give me 15 grand. Well, cool. What changed? Uh, you know, I'm not using my dozer anymore. My tow bar, you're taking care of it all. No, no. They just decided, you know, that's kind of how it works. And talking to some other local folks, that is kind of how some of these guys work where they started at a dollar, they ended a hundred thousand. And a lot of people tell them no, but some people say yes. And that's all they really care about. They just put as much money in their pocket as they can and kind of string you along until you're in a bind and then you have to pay it. So not sure if that's going to happen or not. Not really thrilled about paying them 15 grand when the original price was 7,500. I uh, don't know where I'm going to come up with an extra 7,500 bucks and don't really know how to get it moved. But if you guys got some ideas of how to move a 130 foot long, uh, you know, 85,000 pound airplane, 400 feet from over there onto its final foundation. Uh, cranes were talked about picking and swinging. That's an option. Uh, runs about 26.5 to do it that way. Trying to save some money on that. 
So yeah, any, uh, any ideas uh, aside from just hooking up the D8 dozer and dragging the thing once there's a bunch of snow on the ground, I uh, love to hear them. That's what the comments below are for. Stay tuned, you'll see a lot more happening in the next coming weeks. We'll be switching to interior work here soon, which I'm super excited for, getting interior walls framed up, getting that shiplap on the inside there, continuing to restore parts of the cockpit, uh, and overall excited to, well, get inside as it starts snowing and getting colder here in Alaska. So thank you so much for watching, guys. You know what to do. If you cannot fly every day, fly 8 Check out all the other airplane build series. Uh, link is in the description below to that playlist. Subscribe and like the video. We greatly appreciate that, and we will see you guys in the next one.